Okay, welcome to 3810 Existentialism for our summer session. This is our first lecture. I think I'm going to jump straight into it and then go to syllabus stuff just for you know your own general engagement and interest and, and whatnot. I have uh, two people in class with me. Let's say hello. Uh, here's your two classmates who showed up. Um, so because the building locks just, you know, like, you know, I suppose get this out of the way first. Um, I think what I'm going to do is shift class back one hour. So starting at five on Wednesdays. Um, so hopefully that's okay for you all. Um, and that way, if you're going to show up in person or anybody here who's planning on it to ever come in person, um, you just have to be here before five, right? Otherwise the building locks and then you're screwed. Um, and I'll start promptly or as promptly as I'm capable of, which can sometimes be less than completely promptly. Um, so for today's lecture, there's, you don't get the 10 points that today is just for you. Um, I hope I flagged that. And if I didn't, then I pulled the wool over your eyes just to have you all here to ask questions. It's a win-win because -win you get some fun existentialism stuff to start with, plus uh, extra detail on my experimental syllabus. So um, jumping straight into it, is there such a thing as existentialism? You all signed up for the class, right? Um, you saw in the, the course catalog for the summer session that the philosophy department was offering a class on this topic. Um, I'm gonna tell you right now, as your professor of existentialism is, uh, as your profession, professor of existentialism, I don't know what existentialism is. I, I have no idea. Um, and most of the uh, secondary literature, the, the uh, other academics who work on the existentialists don't know either. Everybody purports to, to have their own definition, right? Um, everybody thinks that they know what existentialism is. Um, but only one of the people on our entire syllabus, including the uh, recommended or, you know, like just the for fun books that I added into, um, claimed themselves to be an existentialist. Now, uh, Camus and Beauvoir and even Heidegger for a while, like played around with the, the moniker for themselves, but all ultimately ended up giving it up except for Sartre. He, he is the only existentialist. So if what we're interested in is existentialism or even just at all answering the question, is there such a thing as existentialism? Um, then sure, it's whatever Sartre said right? Done. Um, and we'll read some Sartre um, going into uh, the, the later part of our session together. Um, so is there such a thing as existentialism? What is it? Um, I don't know, but at least there are a um, series, a set of concepts and importantly experiences, qualities of being, of, of existing, of living that uh, are made similarly, analogously um, problematic for all of these different thinkers um, that are on your syllabus and, and many more too. Um, there's all sorts of interesting existentialist themes uh, throughout world history. Now, um, that's a, another uh, way of thinking about existentialism as a theme, as a kind of uh, motif or quality, a, a coloration of uh, an otherwise uh, genreed uh, topic or, or literature. Um, but uh, in general, existentialism takes uh, being with a capital B to be a problem. Okay. So this means that it's not any particular kind of being that the philosophers have been talking about for generations, right? Um, the, the being of mind, the being of knowledge, uh, the, the being good, right? Um, these are all really big questions in uh, philosophy for years and years and years. And it isn't until um, say the 1800s or so, right? Or the 19th century that being itself, the experience of being becomes a kind of philosophical problem. And it's, it, it sees its nascent beginnings in the 19th century with um, uh, uh, Kierkegaard and uh, 
uh, Nietzsche, uh, dealing with the very beginnings of the issues that um, become essential to um, existentialist thinking in the, the core texts, as I've called them later in the syllabus, uh, in the 20th century post-World War II. And what these first existentialists, if, if they can be called that at all, Kierkegaard and, and Nietzsche are dealing with, are sort of opposite sides of this problem of being. What is it to be at all? And how do we find meaning or value or um, quality? How do we find purpose in the fact that we are, the fact that we exist? Um, and one theme that, that comes with this kind of question, this kind of problematic, um, is that existence precedes essence, right? So being wouldn't be a problem if we intuited or um, uh, just took it for granted that essence precedes existence, which is the way that um, most of the, the Western world um, had conceived of being uh, since the time of, say, um, Plato, Socrates, and probably even the pre-Socratics. So what, what is existence and essence and proceeding, exceeding, what, what, what does this mean? So if essence precedes existence, then life can be meaningful because there are such things, according to say Plato and even Descartes, um, the, as, as forms of the good, as these sort of abstract entities that exist out in the world separate from us, to which our behavior, our living, our being in general refers to, that, that it connects up, it, it hooks together with these um, abstractions, these forms, or uh, these concepts. For Descartes, it was uh, being rational, being a thinking thing, right? That there was something it was like to be a thinking thing that abstractly exists and uh, humans are best when they are uh, acting in accordance with it. For uh, Plato, again, it's, it's uh, uh, revealing the world of the forms as well as you're able. Um, the philosopher King uh, is able to escape the cave, but nobody else really does. Um, for uh, Augustine, Aquinas, and, and the whole scholastic tradition, for this um, deeply religious world, um, it was God, right? God is this abstraction, this um, universal entity. Uh, a being powerful, ultimate, and complete, but still somehow completely uh, divorced, except through, say, miracle and, and divine works in our lives. Um, and so to operate uh, within what, you know, your favorite um, particular Christian or Abrahamic uh, sect of um, uh, you know, God worshiping uh, was, was to have an essence that precedes your existence so that as, exist, as an existing thing, you can exist in accordance with that and be good, have, find value, find meaning. Say, my purpose is to be like God. My purpose is to um, do God's will. And, and as long as I do, then uh, there's value um, in, in my being and my existence, right? So what happens when we switch this on its head? When we say it's not essence that precedes existence, but the other way around, that in fact, essences or concepts are derivative of experience and that existence precedes essence. This is Sartre's um, famous phrase, right? The, the phrase that uh, when you, know, you hear existentialism, that one comes up um, more than any others, right? Um, if existence precedes essence, then there are no, there, there's no will of God, uh, at least um, clearly hook upable to, um, there's no form of the good. There's no abstract principle of, of reason or of uh, ethical valuation that, um, that, that can give us meaning uh, in our existence because all of those ideas, those concepts, those abstractions are derivative of our existence in the first place. So it's not like they exist, and because they exist, we can strive for them. No, we create them ourselves. We suppose them. We, we um, purport them to be. And uh, because they are uh, uh, these, these uh, ideas that, that are based on existence, but only the particular subjective experiences of 
um, a few people. It's, there's nothing universal about them. There's no um, uh, perfect way to hook up any of our behaviors, any of our actions to them. Um, the question of meaning and of value becomes a problem. The question of being itself becomes a problem. Because you can say, well, my life is, is valuable because I always do the greatest good for the greatest number of people. But as soon as you start asking why, as soon as you start um, uh, considering what makes that ethical principle or uh, that abstraction uh, a perfect universal and unshakable ground for the justification of your being, your existing as a life, um, you end up hitting bedrock. You end up without a clear or precise answer. There are always objections to uh, the abstractions and justifications for existence, just so long as existence precedes essence, as long as those abstractions, ideas, and concepts, those systems of valuation are derivative, are, uh, uh, they, they follow existence rather than uh, give it what it needs to be meaningful. Okay, so um, this existence preceding essence problem and the problem of value and meaning find their first um, sort of holds in the, the Western philosophical tradition, like I said, with Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, operating on two halves of, of um, uh, the, the same problem, where for the whole previous rest of you know, Western thought, um, it was enough to follow God's will. But for Kierkegaard, what Kierkegaard says is, look, um, what if what I understand to be good is contrary to God's will? And he expresses this through um, the, the binding of Isaac, Abraham's going up to the mount to sacrifice his son. Um, what is supposed to give me value in, in being, what, what's supposed to make me feel like, like I'm doing the right thing if what feels like the right thing and what uh, has been ordained as the only way to determine the right thing, God's will, um, come into conflict with one another? How can uh, the singular beer, exister, person, um, confront the absolute and universal and still walk away with a conceivable or at least a, a workable, uh, acceptable maybe even, uh, conception of, of value and, and of uh, uh, meaning for their existence. Because um, if what God's will is, is universal, infinite, and I am finite and subjective, um, contingent even, uh, then these two things don't always hook together and, and they will come in conflict as they do in the story of Abraham, and even of Job too. Um, another really interesting uh, story in the Bible. Both of these stories historically had been interpreted as um, tests of faith and that in the, the crucial moment of the absurd, which I'll talk about in just a second, in the crucial moment of absurdity, uh, there's supposed to be this reification of faith, this this uh, acceptance or this uh, ah yes, uh, praise be, right kind of experience. Um, until Kierkegaard says, wait a second, um, that doesn't totally click with what I feel, my being, my existence, right? Um, what, what does Job feel in that moment or Abraham? And is there a way to solve the problem of their being, right? Being in, that, in those moments of divine contradiction. Now on the other um, uh, side of the coin, we have Nietzsche, who is contending uh, with the problem of being, of meaning, of value without God um, in the face of a godless world. Must we fall into complete and total nihilism? Must we give in to um, the, the, the inability to make anything meaningful, to, to have existence be worth anything, to be um, uh, coherent, conceivable, and not just uh, a big, awful, meaningless rat race. Right? And according to Nietzsche, there, there's a very particular way in which we, we can do this. Um, we can face up to the empty abyss that is um, the, the world in front of us and recognize ourselves beings who are able to create our own meanings, derive um, a value from the nothing uh, because we exist. Uh, and we'll see that too. Um, and so we, we have these like two halves of different questions, right? Um, 
how does the, the singular, the individual relate to the absolute, whether the absolute is the universal uh, God, a universal being, or the universal, this, this, this like complete uh, emptiness, right? They're, it's both um, a, a, a relation of um, one to the whole um, and how that is supposed to uh, make sense and, and make our being justified, worth it, valuable, et cetera, right? So, um, We'll also be looking at Dostoevsky, who is somewhere in between uh, Nietzsche and Kierkegaard. He, he's writing uh, contemporar contemporarily, contemporaneously with, um, with both Kierkegaard and Nietzsche. 1864, I think, is when The Brothers Karamazov was published. Also about that time, Nietzsche was publishing Genealogy of Morals and Kierkegaard either or in Fear and Trembling. So they're all sort of like living in this same time period that's really inspiring this like intellectual power and this problematic the problematic of being though it hasn't taken an explicit philosophical grip yet it's experiencing itself it's experiencing itself through um literature and poetry and philosophy and and really just the blend of all of these Kierkegaard is as much a philosopher as he is a poet and an author um Dostoevsky more an author but also very deeply um, philosophically inclined, and Nietzsche, uh, a, probably a poet first uh, and philosopher second. Um, and so these, in these sort of um, nascent, primordial, creative swamps of thinking, we, we get the, the first problematics of these um, questions and, and, and of being. And so Dostoevsky, um, it, it's an interesting question whether he gives an answer in the same way as Kierkegaard and Nietzsche to the problem of being, how to find value and meaning in life, or if he just poses the question. Um, and, and that'll be how uh, sort of the, the lecture on Dostoevsky is um, aimed, uh, whether or not he's just expressing what the problem is or um, giving us a solution as well. I think he gives us a solution, um, but it's really in the eye of the reader, which is kind of the power of literature, right? Um, and so where existentialism, this problematic of being begins in this primordial swamp of creative goo, right? Um, it continues uh, where and when it gets its full, complete, robust um, conception, its, its actual direct uh, uh, conception is uh, in the post-World War II Europe, uh, that was a world which everyone who remained grew up in the old world, right? This is uh, an actual term, the old world, meaning the world of the aristocracy, the world of uh, politeness and morality. When you read, say, like Pride and Prejudice or um, any of these like 1700s, 1800s novels, the red and the black is a really good example. Um, uh, even... Uh, you know, uh, uh, Madame Bovary and, and Proust, and, like all these people are, are writing about, um, you know, like the prim and proper world and, and about virtues that, that exist and subsist in that world. Um, this is the old world of the old haughty toddy aristocrats who um, know what good is and, and they've, uh, they've refined their lives to a point at which the, the slightest tilt of the head upwards towards someone had a meaning uh, as, as deep and as expressible as an entire chapter in Proust, right? Um, and, and this is the, the strength of the moral system, whether or not it was you know, totally pervasive across all social boundaries, it wasn't. Um, this is at least like the, the uh, intellectual world that um, exists at the time and is completely destroyed by World War II. The world itself physically is bombed out, right? Towns are gone. Uh, beautiful fields that used to be are uh, entrenched, mine-filled, you know, war planes, burning ash, uh, falling from the sky, hell and brimstone Europe, right? Um, and, and in the wake of this, you know, mass death of uh, an entire population, um, there's also the death of this old world morality. 
this old system of, of uh, intellectual structure that was so dominant for so many hundreds of years, all the way back to Rome, right? In the, the, the fall of Rome and the, the restructuring of the world under the, um, the, the Catholic church, uh, th this is where these morals come from, right? So for hundreds and hundreds of years, Europe is dominated by a moral system that's just blipped out of existence, immediately crushed. And so no surprise that the, the, the underpinnings of the problem of being were beginning to boil before the wars and really exploded in this moment when the world itself is absurd. It's not just my own experience of my, the meaninglessness of my being, right? The, my own gazing into the absurd and wondering, or into the, the abyss and, and wondering if, um, you know, I, I must fall in and become one with the darkness or um, if, you know, God telling me to sacrifice my chosen son really is the good thing, even though it is the will of God, it, it runs contrary to my whole being. Um, that, that these thoughts become seen in the world, that just by looking around, opening your door, you see uh, buildings blown up, you see families without sons and daughters, you see um, a world without uh, a moral structure that used to be there. Um, and just the, the world itself was in a, in a state of absurdity. And so of course, these um, French and, and English and German intellectuals who are living through this time, um, take the inspiration from their predecessors and like blow it up to the max. And so in the, the 50s, uh, existentialism has this huge boom. Uh, it's the, the time of, of Sartre, of Beauvoir, of Camus, um, of uh, more second wave feminism is invented in this time period. Um, there's there's a, a massive explosion of uh, thinkers worrying about being. How can we exist in this world that's so hellish and awful that allowed itself to murder itself? Um, where can we find meaning in that sort of world? And question begins to, to shift too, where in, in Nietzsche, Dostoevsky, Kierkegaard, and existentialist predecessors, Heidegger maybe too, um, there was always, a, a, it was taken for granted. And, and this is me talking now, right? Like, like I, I'm not, uh, I don't mean to purport the, the truth of this, but this is the sense that I get from, from reading these guys and, um, and studying the history of the time is that they took for granted that there could be something meaningful in the world, that life could be meaningful. We just had to like find the right tool, the, the right interpretation to re-click the world back into the slot it needed to be so that we could carry on our happy lives, right? Um, for the, the, the core existentialists in this period post-war, even that is given up. There's no right interpretation. The world is meaningless and the meaning that we create or that is the, the, um, the underlying current of our lives, of our practical behavior in the world, um, is also meaningless itself. And so living this way, where even if you find an interpretation that allows you to have what you consider to be a meaningful life, you still yet recognize that whatever it is that that meaningful being feels like to you is meaningless. And this is to um, live in a complete state of absurdity, uh, or at least for Camus, uh, for Beauvoir, it's a state of complete ambiguity. Uh, for Heidegger, a state of total anxiety. Now we're not gonna read, if you wanna read Heidegger, reach out to me personally, but nobody should be forced to read Heidegger ever in their entire lives. <laughs> um, so we're not gonna read Heidegger. Um, and you kind of, I feel like you don't have to read Heidegger to get the important concepts for the, the like core existentialists. Um, who are all incredibly interesting in their own right. But for, for all of these guys, right, um, the, the state of, of anxiety or alienation of uh, absurdity and ambiguity um, is its own problem because being never ceases to be a problem, right? Being can cease to be a problem if we can make being meaningful. 
um, if we can create our own value, if we can be value creators as Nietzsche purports, or if we can be knights of faith as Kierkegaard would want us to be, or if we could be something like Alyosha in The Brothers Karamazov, um, it was based on Dostoevsky's son. Um, if we can be a kind of like divine being just you know, sort of naturally, um, then being ceases to be a problem as long as that's occurring. But for the existentialists who come post-World War II, that's no longer a possibility. The, the thin veil of reality, of, of the, the veneer of meaning, of value, of justification for existence and action in the world at all has been stripped away and all that's left is nothing, a broken uh, shell hole of what used to be, right? Um, and this is really troubling. And uh, what the, the existentialists, particularly Camus, Bavor, and Sartre, um, are contending with. And, and that's where we'll end the course is with them. So we're gonna deal with the problem of being and, and uh, its different iterations, how it sort of developed, which should inspire um, the, the core texts themselves. Um, and, and I think, so existentialism kind of dies after say 1965, 1970. Um, it's, it's having a bit of a resurgence, uh, though not so explicitly. Um, and again, no surprise in a world where you have billionaires with billions of dollars hoarding all of the wealth of the world, causing the suffering of millions and billions of people globally. Um, and the suffering isn't just felt by like the, like the, the low, like your, your most impoverished people, it's felt across boundaries. If you are not uber hyper rich, then you are not uh, like, you know, able to experience the world. It, it, all it takes is flicking on the news. You turn on your local news, which by the way, don't turn on your local news. Um, you see that the world we live in is pretty damn absurd, that the world is full of uh, rape and murder and torture and accidents and bloody mess, right? That there's missiles being shot, that there's uh, you know, financial fair and, and like, it, just, it is a mess, right? Um, and the, the balm that we're given, is more, right? Is this material more? Is um, scroll once more through your phone, buy this other streaming service, purchase that thing, um, look at this pretty picture, put your own pretty picture up, get one more like, right? Um, this is how we deal with that feeling now. It's the, the common culture of our world to cope with our own absurd existence, our own post World War II feeling, but now here in the 21st century, this um, technological nightmare that we found ourselves in. And like, I work in IT as well. I have a second job, I'm a systems admin. I love tech, I think it's super cool and there's like really neat ways to, to use it. Um, but the, the, the way in which we use it, we're, we're like little children with AK-47s, which is actually a real thing that happens in the world. Like talk about freaking absurd, right? Um, that we cope with the world so poorly. And I think that the existentialist motif, uh, philosophy, the, the way of thinking existentially, whatever existentialism is supposed to be, um, can help us reorient and reinterpret um, what our own problems with being are supposed to be. What, what, what it is that makes us feel anxiety makes us feel alienated. And um, what the solutions that, that we have to that are really doing for us. Um, and this is a purely personal project. Okay, so um, we're not gonna be doing uh, therapy sessions for, for everybody in this class. Um, that's on you. I, I just mean to say that as we go through these works, um, I hope that those are the sorts of thoughts that you begin to have that, um, a historical philosophical movement that you know really blows up in the, the 40s and 50s and dies out still is relevant today. In fact, incredibly relevant. Um, and that the concepts and arguments and uh, works that we'll read through and learn about um, will 
be not only you know uh, fun because they're beautiful. They're just like the writing is so good. It's literature, and, and in some cases, it's literally literature. Um, but there's also a, a therapeutic component as well that I'd, I'd hope all of you will um, find in taking the course. Um, so let's see. Uh, I have other stuff about freedom, uh, but that was like 30 minutes of lecture. I, I suppose we have a lot of people here. Does anybody have question questions? Um, anybody like to say anything? Hello? Before we move on to syllabus stuff? Now is your opportunity. Opportunities passing very soon. Oh, Arlen, go ahead. Hello. Um, am I audible? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when you were uh, talking earlier about existence and essence, I was wondering if it makes sense to conceive of it in terms of sort of the the contingent and the necessary. Like, if there is an essence that is necessary that precedes existence, then that is universal but if if there exists an essence that derives from existence then it's contingent then it's um just an accident and we we cannot have the same surety in it yeah yeah that's 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 just about right um and the the contingency or subjectivity of um, any ethical system that the idea is that a value that is derivative of existence that that is something that we we separate from we talk about is uh, a value in name only and that true value real meaning the the problem of being isn't so problematic just so long as that uh, value in name only is integrated into our practical behavior so uh, here's some heidegger for you um, this is where this all really comes from is that when I am absorbed in the world, I'm coping with the world around me, say uh, using a, a, a sport is a really helpful example. So say I'm uh, skiing, okay? Um, as long as I'm moving, as long as I'm carving down the mountain in between the trees, I'm moving around and over the moguls, um, I'm absorbed in my activity. My skis are not, actually physically a part of me, right? They're not like my hand, but they are an extension of me. They become a tool that uh, I just, I, I use automatically that, that it becomes a part of my, my absorbed doing in the world. That um, my experience of skiing takes in the, the quality of uh, snow and the contours of the mountain and the tools that I'm using, my poles and my skis, all as part and parcel of the, the holistic and complete experience that makes my absorption possible. And we might call this skiing, right? Um, the, the, the full experience, the use of the tools and the integration of self and world, et cetera. Um, you might call it skiing with like a little asterisk, right? Because the skiing um, is not skiing in name, it's skiing and doing. And then as soon as I, I you know, like slide my skis sideways and I get to the bottom of the, the hill and then all of a sudden I'm at the lift, I think back on what I was doing and I call that skiing. But I recognize that what I'm thinking about is no longer what it was. It's not skiing in being and doing, it's skiing in, in name only, in thought, in, in conception. Um, and I might even have some anxiety about that, that, uh, the, especially if you know skiing is like the most important valuable thing in the world to me all of a sudden i'm not doing it that thing that i, I qualify that i pick out as skiing in name is no longer uh you know like a part of me and so in in thinking about uh this this activity i uh step out of my state of absorption in it and recognize it as something distinct from myself as something separate from this is another kind of way in which the problem of being takes a grip on us is that when we start thinking about these ethics, when we're not living them, um, they're just ethics in name only, right? They don't actually uh, uh, give their value to us and to our quality of life and existence um, as long as they are what Heidegger calls present at hand, as long as they are objects outside of the absorption 
of, of our you know, interaction with them. Um, and this causes an anxiety and a recognition of the, the nothingness, the, the uh, infinite uh, liminal space of, of absolute emptiness between myself and uh, the, the tools and, and present and hand objects and conceptions of the world. This is why Heidegger is a mess. There's, you know, what, what he's trying to do is, is talk about the, the like absorbed state of being and give like a whole ontology and, and uh, build all of these concepts for an absorbed state of being, which is a conceptual, which is um, without an ability to like grip in. Um, and, uh, and, and so he, he is amazing, but it, it is a painful mess to try and work through the aconceptual. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just wondering how much does it matter if the ethics work? You know what I'm saying? Like it, it, despite them having meaning or not, the fact that they work for some people, you know, does that have any bearing on what they mean to the existentialist at all? Sure. So the, the question, could everybody hear that, by the way? This is a good test. You could all hear the question? Okay. Because if you can, I'll, I'll repeat them, but um, the nods confirm. So um, the answer to this is that uh, there are still moments of absurd. So if, if an ethics works, then sure, great, like use it. Um, but are we going to be able to use it authentically? This is another existentialist theme, authenticity. And bad faith is another Sartre term that, that comes from this. Um, authenticity is the expression of your freedom in such a way, and so I'm paraphrasing, I haven't prepared to answer this, but the, the authenticity is the, the expression of your freedom in a way that um, you universally permit. So Dostoevsky's character, Ivan, in The Brothers Karamazov says, God is dead, so everything is permissible. Uh, Sartre following says, there is no God. And so uh, in so far as we are radically free, we are completely free, whatever we do, we permit for the whole world, right? So you might have a system of ethics that usually kind of works, right? Um, follow the will of God, for instance. Let's say that um, following the will of God generally works and everybody lives happily ever after until the will of God tells you to drive your knife into Isaac's chest. All of a sudden, you have a crisis of faith. You have a crisis of your authentic free will. Your free will might be to completely live in alignment with God's will, but then you're asked to kill your favorite son, your only son, um, uh, your youngest and, and, and most beloved. Um, and here's this moment where uh, you've been living freely for an ethical system. And in the, the scratch of the absurd, you find a contradiction and that makes you question, have I been living authentically? Have I been, I've been living as an expression of my free self authentically or have I been living for the sake of some you know, system of ethics in name only? Um, and this is a, a really big theme for the existentialists, for all existentialists, um, how we express our freedom and how we express it authentically is totally essential. Now, Sartre's example, um, is awesome. And we're not going to look at it because I didn't assign um, being in nothingness, uh, which is also like a huge mess to read um, and covers like, you know, every single philosophical topic under the sun because Sartre is just about every kind of philosopher. Um, but, but his example there is, is imagine Pierre the waiter. Pierre is a, a snooty, haughty waiter that uh, at, at an upscale restaurant, right, uh, wears a tuxedo and, and says, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, um, to all of your requests and uh, is just the essence of politeness, is so kind, right? Um, but then behind your back, it's like, oh, 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 these stupid people, they are impolite, they eat with spoons what they should eat with force, right? Um, and uh, this is an expression of inauthenticity or what Sartre says, bad faith. It's when we act for the sake of a principle that we do not believe in, that, that is not meaning making for us, right? Um, uh, another example from Sartre is, is the, the lover, like two people, the crush, they're like walking down a street together and they kind of like touch hands and they really want to hold hands, but they're too nervous to do it. And so they, they like, they, they embody this, this, um, 
feeling of, of uh, this valuation of love and yet their fear like makes them live authentically and they, they operate in bad faith towards one another because they're always afraid, um, this sort of thing, right? Um, yeah, go ahead. So Uh, we'll see um, as, as we go on. Um, what authenticity is supposed to be, how it works, it's going to be different for every existentialist. And that's kind of like, it, that's going to be my answer to a lot of questions like this. You ask me, like, what is concept? Um, and, and part of the reason that I started the lecture with, what is existentialism? I don't know, is because every existentialist thinker will say something slightly different about um, uh, these ideas. Uh, Okay, any final words before we move on to syllabus? Cool. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen so that you all can see the syllabus. How's that look? Does it look good? You like it? Okay, we'll start at the beginning and we'll end at the end. It's a good way to do things. Um, okay, so I don't hold office hours, just contact me. I'm really available. Um, send me an email, and I suppose you guys all have my phone number now too. I'd prefer it if you emailed me, um, but for like emergencies, I suppose that it's fine if you dig up my phone number and text me. Um, the, the issue with text is that I will ignore it, like I ignore all of my other text messages. Um, whereas with emails, I, I feel a certain uh, kind of responsibility for it. Uh, and maybe that's a kind of bad faith is being inauthentic with one form of communication, but more thorough with another. <laughs> Who knows? Um, okay, so required texts. Uh, I don't like to require texts. I try to give students everything for free if I can. Existentialism is different. And I'm gonna like, like hammer this in as I talk about the syllabus is, is that in order to understand existentialism, in order to even be able to begin talking about giving a, a bad answer to the question, what is existentialism? Is there such a thing as? You have to like read all of existentialism. Um, and it's true for the books themselves too, that in order to like understand the book, you have to have already read the whole book. Um, it's just a, like a, a sad fact of the confusing, mostly holistic way in which these guys argue. They don't argue like analytic philosophers. If you've taken a philosophy class before that you'll probably recognize, um, they argue in a full circle. And that's not, that they're not making circular arguments. I mean, sometimes everybody you know, makes mistakes. But, but what I mean is that they argue in a full circle is like the, you, you gotta like see the whole picture. And that means reading the whole thing before you really get a sense of like what it is that circle is supposed to be, um, you know, surrounding. Um, so similar with the each individual book, the existentialism of the whole means that you kind of got to like read existentialism, all of it um, as a whole. Uh, and so these four books that I've required are like your most important core texts, the, the real like uh, grit and grime, the, the meat of existentialism is, is in these. And it's like 35 bucks. So um, suffer with having a, a much cooler library. Uh, and the other resource is a video, it's a movie, The Seventh Seal by Ingmar Bergman. If you know Ingrid Bergman from Casablanca and all sorts of other films, it's her dad um, or husband, I think dad. Anyways, Ingmar Bergman was making movies in the 50s, but like really got famous in the 60s and um, 70s and he is, He's an existentialist filmmaker. His films are existentialist um, through and through. The guy kicks ass. Um, I was watching Winter Light last night, uh, which is the second part of a trilogy uh, dealing with the relationship between God and uh, the loss of faith. It's awesome. Anyways, um, the movie we're going to be watching is The Seventh Seal, which is uh, just like a perfect uh film adaptation of existentialist thought. We'll do a movie night. And if you guys want to come to campus, I'll buy a bunch of popcorn and make it. And we'll watch it on the big TV and it'll be kind of fun. Um, 
There are also uh, optional texts. You can buy them if you would like to own them, uh, but I will be making photocopies of these. That's the Portable Nietzsche Untimely Meditations by Nietzsche, Brothers Karamazov, and Fear and Trembling. Um, I also listed a bunch of other really fun um, uh, existentialist works here. Uh, of course, this is not an exhaustive list. Um, this is just other stuff that I've read and really enjoyed. And if you would like to um, dig deeper or look for alternative uh, existentialist perspectives, these are great. I really recommend Buber. Um, he's one that I just got into. Um, he gives it like a, a very strongly Jewish inspired uh, existentialist perspective. Um, it's really fascinating. And he's, you know, like everybody, a poet. Okay. So uh, course schedule, I, I talked about a lot of this, so I'll just go really roughly over it. Um, next week, you're going to read The Whole Stranger. So like 120 pages. I went to the park this summer and read it in an afternoon. It's a quick read. It goes pretty fast. Um, you could break it off into two days. It's in two parts, like 60 pages each. Um, and it's a novel. So, I mean, you, you don't have to like think so hard. Um, just enjoy the book. Uh, give yourself some time to, to work through it. Um, but that's for next week. Um, the Stranger is uh, almost as much about what is unsaid and undone as it is what is said and done. Uh, do not think of Marceau as a hero, um, but as a focus, a main character. Um, we'll talk about it next week. Um, once we have the stranger under our belts, the rest of the, the uh, summer session will be an attempt to understand what the hell happened in the stranger, okay? Because the strangers are really good expression of the existentialist problem of being and uh, first shots at an answer. Um, and so again, the rest of the semester is going to you know, be focusing on um, how we can interpret and understand that book. So um, the first bit is God, faith, and the absurd, right? So uh, we'll look at Dostoevsky, we'll look at Kierkegaard, we'll look at Nietzsche. Um, and these are you know, your, your sort of predecessors to um, the core existentialist thought. And then finally, The Seventh Seal, which uh, as a movie is, is about a knight from the Crusades returning during the time of the Black Death to play a game of chess with death. Uh, and there's all sorts of cool like religious and existentialist themes throughout. Um, so once we have a good sense of absurd, of um, the relationship between nothingness and being, God and, and being will step away from uh, uh, problems to do with God's existence or non-existence and just assume that God doesn't exist like Camus, Sartre, and Beauvoir do. Um, the, they are known as existentialist atheists. Um, they assume that you know, there is no God and that God really isn't even so much a problem. Um, and so they don't worry about it. Uh, and we will read the myth of Sisyphus. One must imagine Sisyphus happy, right? Um, we will read Sartre's existentialism as a humanism, which is really great, um, like abundantly clear uh, interpretation of Sartre's existentialist career. And then we're gonna end with Simone de Beauvoir, who I think uh, is the best existentialist. Camus is my favorite existentialist, but I think Beauvoir is very clearly the best. Um, she makes little pokes and jabs at all of the others. And is but what she's doing is she's developing and perfecting um, the, the views of, of uh, her contemporaries um, and, and making it work. She is also really tough to read. Um, so uh, be ready for that, especially because it comes last. Um, so that's, that's the reading schedule. I saw some comments. Let me open up the chat real quick so I can read. Um, I'll talk about the plague at the end. Oh yeah, there's no reading for today. Uh, read the whole of The Stranger for next week. So you have one week to read 120 pages in novel form. Uh, not so tough. Cool, okay. Um, and like I said, I'll talk about the plague at the end. This is the most important part of today. Uh, not that uh, existence precedes essence, surprise, bada boom, but that you have to get a grade in the course and um, this is how that will work. So 
I'm going to say it right out. The goal of this course, your my, my objective as your teacher in this course is to get you to be able to answer the question that I started lecture with. What is existentialism? Is there such a thing as existentialism? Um, that's my goal. And in order for that goal to be a success, you got to read. Um, and there are all sorts of ways to disincentivize reading by forcing you to do it, right? Um, which I think are awful, right? Nobody wants to be forced to read, especially something that's hard. Like I just said, Beauvoir is really tough to read. She, you will go slowly through her um, or you won't understand any of it um, if you don't go slow enough. Um, she's tough and everybody else is tough too. And you gotta read all of it to get it. So what I wanna do with this course is to give you the opportunity and the ability, the capacity to like desire to not feel like uh, you need to be stressed about it. So I don't know about like what other classes you're taking. Um, that, that you know makes no difference to me that that's on you for how you schedule your own time. Um, but at least for what I've scheduled and structured here, the goal is to give you the opportunity to read everything and, and to like have a good time doing it. Okay, so. Um, with that in mind, I've structured a grading system that is entirely experimental. This is a, a, a new system. I haven't built a course that grades this way before. Um, and I'm hoping that it really works. Uh, it may not, but we'll see. Um, so the, the idea of this grading system is that there's more than the actual number of points you need to get 100% in the course. Every point that you earn is 1% of your grade. Okay, and there's 300 possible points, right? There's 100 possible points that you can earn through attendance, 100 possible points that you can earn through exams, and another 100 points that you can earn through uh, discussing on the discussion board. Uh, and I think I win no matter what, right? If you are showing up to lecture, engaged, listening, uh, taking part, uh, asking questions, or at least just like being here, um, then you're you know, taking a class in good faith. You're you know, authentically seeking out the, the lessons and um, to, to be engaged with the learning experience. Uh, you get all of the information and uh, you save yourself from having to do the busy work of studying or uh, talking on the discussion board, which gives you more time to read. Please do all of the reading. Um, if you decide I'm never gonna show up, I'm not gonna talk on the discussion board, I'm just gonna pass the exams. Great, because that shows that You've, uh, you've learned enough to express a competency with the course material, perfect. Or you say, I don't wanna take any tests. I also don't wanna show up. I'll just talk on the discussion board. Um, the points for the discussion board, uh, if you earn your entire class grade that way, means that you're engaging critically with your fellow students. You're engaging in the practice of philosophy, which so often is not incentivized or even done in philosophy classes. We learn this, highfalutin theoretical arguments and uh, objections to them. And what, what does that actually do for our real life? Nothing, right? Or very little. Um, what philosophy is supposed to be is a kind of therapy. It's something in practice, something that's done. It's an active thing. Uh, and I think contemporary philosophical practice in academia has lost that by and large, uh, especially for um, the student who isn't going to live the life of academic philosophy. Like that, that's the life that I chose, right? Here I am. Um, but many of you all aren't even philosophy majors. There's a bunch of poli-sci majors, which is kind of cool. Um, so, you know, living philosophically is really important. You do that in an online class by engaging with your classmates in the discussion board. So if you do that, then I win that way too, because you're all critically engaging with each other. So I think no matter what, um, as long as you, you know, earn your points somehow, uh, course goal achieved, but do the reading. Please do the reading. Um, now, I recognize that by offering so many points, uh, possible points for attendance or for exams or for discussion board posts, there are ways to like break and cheat this system. That would be taking this course in bad faith, right? Don't do it. It's like cheating in an ethics class. Don't do it. It's bad. Um, and, and I've tried to structure things so that this doesn't happen. Like you may only earn up to 50 points before the midterm. I don't want you to like get hundred points in a month and then tune out for the rest of the semester, right? I'd like everyone to continue to um, follow through with the entire class because that's what the course objective is for and, and made up of. Um, 
And, and so at the end of the syllabus, you'll see this is like a sketch and I'm liable to change anything at any time. Um, usually that's just added in case of emergencies. In this case, because the grading system is experimental, I really do mean it. Um, if I see signs of abuse of the grading system, uh, which I'll decide if it's abuse or not, um, then I'll tweak things here and there, but add you know, little patches to the system and, and it won't ever change anything dramatically. So um, I might lower the amount of points that you can continue to earn, whatever points you've earned, you've already earned. So you know, if you find a way to abuse the system and want to cheat in your ethics course, don't do it. Um, then you know, you've already earned those points, whatever going forward. I might like change the amount of points that you can earn for attending or for showing up with your Zoom camera or whatever discussion board or how exams go, or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, because again, the, the course goal is to get you to be able to answer that question um, and every single one of you too. Um, so there might be small changes here and there. Um, look out for those. I'll be really vocal about them. You'll get a couple of emails and I'll update the syllabus and I'll do an announcement and all that sort of thing. So you, you don't have to feel surprised or like I'm pulling the wool over your eyes. Um, I, I wanna be like super transparent. Um, and to that end, if anybody has like a specific, typically medical reason, but you know, other reasons can work too, um, that they wanna be in class and participate, but not um, uh, turn on their camera. For instance, I had a student a year ago, like in the fall, who uh, was blind and so preferred to like have their camera off, but they were still like very productive in class. So like that sort of reason, I'll accommodate. Um, so if, if that's, you know, that sort of thing or, you know, other related issues to keep your camera off is, is a thing, then let me know and we can talk about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, like the, the goal is to have you here in class sharing a personal experience sharing the, the educational experience personally, which I think enriches it even through Zoom. Um, and at least it enriches it for me. Um, and so uh, that's sort of the goal of, of having you um, show up with your cameras and whatnot. Uh, Dallas, go ahead. Will you be updating the points throughout the course so we'll know where we're at as we go through the course? Yeah. That's right. Um, so the way that I'm going to track attendance is at some random point during the lecture, I'm going to take a screenshot of everybody that's that's in the Zoom call. It could be the first five minutes of class. It could be the last five minutes of, of class. It could be any time in between. Uh, so you just, you know, you got to be here and you got to be um, wh whatever the screenshot captures is what gets graded. The way that the grades work, I set it up so that all of your grades like don't count towards the final grade. Um, so you're always going to see your grade at zero percent, but you'll know how many points you have, and every point is a percent. Super easy, right? Okay. Um, I explained the exams here. I won't talk about it. The discussion board. The way you earn points for discussion board is by asking a question about the course material that expresses like genuine, genuinely having read. Um, you can earn extra points by answering a student's question, and then you can earn even more points by responding to the answer to your question. So right, this like is supposed to foster back and forth discussion. Anything after that, uh, no points, but I encourage you to like continue discussions that you find interesting because they're interesting, right? Um, and then if anybody is like freaking out at the end of the semester, I have uh, an extra credit option. You can earn like 25% of the grade, 25 points by writing a paper, but there are certain time limits. You have to get a topic approved and then submit the paper with enough time for me to grade it. Um, so that, that's there too. But um, 300 points, you can just take tests. You can just show up. You can just discuss. I imagine most students will do a mixture of the three. Um, does anybody have any questions? All, all of the points are optional. Just earn enough to get the, the grade that you're looking for, you know, and do the reading. For the discussion board, um, it's all the discussions are graded by, well, not in the week that they're mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can always go back. If you read something that, that uh, informs or inspires a question about something else, then I wanna like enable those kinds of discussions. And you can also like, you know, like scramble for points at the end of the semester if that's something you need to do too. Basically, what I wanna do is give you every opportunity for success to read, to understand existentialism, to get the concepts and ideas and find and build your own paths to success. Make 
the class an opportunity to succeed in the way that you will learn best. Um, and again, if there's abuse of that, I'll change it um, here and there, but that's the goal is. It's experimental, that's, that's the idea. I want you guys to succeed in the way that you're best able to, um, and here's the opportunity for it. Okay, any other questions about the, the grading? How do we, do, do we, let me zoom this out. Uh, can I zoom it out? I can. How do you feel about it? Uh, just like initial impressions? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody's kind of happy with it. I figured. <laughs> okay. Um, here's my grading scheme and a meme. I, I normally do PowerPoints, by the way. Today was a bit different. Um, for an in-person class, I like to switch up PowerPoints and just lecturing, but um, normally I'll do PowerPoints and I'll share the screen. Um, so you don't have to like, you know, be so wildly listening to the super lectures. Um, you know, rules, mute your mic, don't eat in class. The syllabus is an outline and I can modify it with reasonable notice. Okay, last bit, the reading group. Um, we live in a plague, and there's a novel by Camus called The Plague. It's very timely. Um, the Plague is about uh, an exis existentialist hero, Dr. Ryu, uh, and all of his fine menagerie of interesting character friends uh, that all represent different uh, archetypes uh, as, as uh, objections to examples of existentialism failed or, or succeeded in, in whatever way. There's a religious dude and there's a, a criminal and a scientific guy and um, they're all sort of struck with the absurd and, and how do these different archetypes of people deal with the absurd? The absurd being the oncoming of a, a black plague-like disease that causes the entire quarantine and shut-in of the city of the, the uh, um, fictional city of Oran in Algiers, where Kim is from. Um, so this, this is just a reading group. Um, if you'd like to take part, uh, who's, by the way, let me do this again uh, so I can see everybody. Is anybody right now planning on taking part who knows about the reading group? Who's here? Okay, so we got like a couple of people and like a maybe here or there. Um, this is like extra reading. It's supposed to be for fun. Um, I'll do this after lecture every other week. The book is broken up into five parts. Uh, each one is, I don't know, like 40 pages. It's not much. Um, and we'll just sit after class uh, and for 30 minutes, and as long as the discussion goes, we'll talk about the book. Um, and, uh, you know, the, again, it's not for points. I'm not going to lecture through it. I'm not going to, you know, like derive concepts and arguments to share with you all like I would for the other readings. Um, we're just going to like talk about it and share like our experiences reading it, what it means to us, what we like about it, what we don't, um, and how the novel might inform our own experience uh, being quarantined away in a plague. Um, so I think what, the first one of those is June 2nd. So there's a few weeks to, to you know, get up to snuff with the first part. Um, and as long as people show up, I'll keep running it. Um, I do reading groups for the graduate students. Um, I like build wild syllabuses. This, this summer we're doing a Kant's third critique. Um, so I really like reading groups. I think they're, yeah, yeah. I, I think they're really fun. Um, they're a great way to experience the, the forms of thought of other people, right? So like how someone reads an argument is sort of expressive of who they are, but it also gives you different interpretations of of works and, and of people in general, especially for reading groups with literature. Um, so it should be a fun time. Hopefully you guys show up. Uh, I'll, I'll you know, always be here because we're doing it after lecture. Um, and that's it. Uh, that's the whole syllabus. Buy the books, do the reading, uh, find a path to success. Don't abuse it, please. Um, and reading group. Any final questions? Oh, there's a bunch of chat. What if you're not freaking out, but you want to do a paper anyways? You absolutely may do that. Um, and you may absolutely earn 325% of your existentialism course. That's totally cool. 
I recommend that you do everything because the more you do, the more you learn and the more you learn, the better you'll be equipped to answer these questions. And especially with a topic like existentialism, you'll be that much more well-equipped to deal with life and the absurdity that is our everyday existence in this 21st century technological nightmare. Okay, awesome. book's bought. Um, anybody else? Questions, chat, hands raised? Can, can you show like the version of the, the stranger you have? if you have with you uh it's linked on the syllabus so if you go up to the course materials there's a hyperlink for the stranger click it and it'll open up an amazon page and that's true of all of the books um and that like take you just like click buy now does that work cool yeah hyperlinks awesome technological nightmare but awesome yep. yeah. anybody else questions comments concerns uh, judgments. Okay, then uh, we'll call it there. I'm going to stop recording, stop share, stop recording. Um, oh, final word. Uh, recordings for lectures. If you don't show up, we'll, you don't get points for watching a recorded lecture. You have to like be here when I screenshot. Um, they'll be up either that evening or the next day. It depends on Zoom because Zoom has to compress everything. And um, so it'll be, you know, tonight or tomorrow morning. Okay. Bye bye.